Welcome. Thank you for joining us today as we share a little about New South Wales, our Department of Primary Industries, and the New South Wales seafood export sector. Um, New South Wales is the largest and most diverse state economy in Australia. Uh, you can see on the map on the left-hand side of your screen where New South Wales sits in relation to the rest of Australia. And on the right-hand side, you can see that in 19, sorry, 2018-19, we made up around about 32% of the entire Australian gross domestic product. So it is by far the largest state economically in Australia. New South Wales is also a key part of what we call the Australian Food Bowl. That's the Murray-Darling Basin. Now, the Murray-Darling catchment is a collection of rivers that all feed together from South Queensland, go through New South Wales into Northern Victoria, and then out through South Australia to the sea. This is an important area for fresh water availability, but also artesian water, which has been stored underground. New South Wales has a very diverse uh, geography and climate. You can see from the map on the right-hand side there that we have a range of different things that we grow in this particular state. On the east coast, because the rainfall is high, we're able to do a lot of dairy activity. So that's our main dairy production region. On the far north coast, the climate is warm enough to be able to grow sugar and bananas. As you go a little bit further west, you have the northern, central and southern tablelands. Now those regions are a little bit cooler, so they're ideal for growing apples, cherries, and a range of um, beef cattle, and um, also fat lamb production. As you go a bit further west, you find that this is also a good region for growing wine. And then as you come down into what's known as the central west slopes and plains, you'll find that it is a little bit warmer, a little bit drier, so that's our ideal cereal growing area. That's where things like wheat, uh, canola, etc., are growing. And also, in the river systems that, that you find across that region, that's where we grow a lot of our cotton and citrus. And then further out west, that's the area where probably it's best for growing sheep, for wool, and also goat production. Um, New South Wales is worldwide known as a premium agribusiness food supplier. You can see from this particular graph that we produce a range of commodities and the production of those is generally increasing. So particularly when it comes to red meat, our beef, sheep and goat meat production is, is rising year on year. Our wool production similarly is increasing, although it can be impacted a little bit more by drought. And then when you go to the far right, the other category is mostly things like cotton and high value products like that. When we look at what we actually export to China, we are happy to say that China is the top export market with strong increasing demand in protein foods, not only red meat, but also dairy and seafood. As you can see from the graph on the right there, the sorts of things that we produce. Now close to 60% of our exports to China fall into the red meat category, either sheep, or beef meat. Wool is another important category, which probably makes up around about a third. And then things like nuts, cotton, and so on make up the balance of our exports to China. Now, when it comes to New South Wales seafood exports, New South Wales produces a diverse range of sensational seafood, including abalone, oysters, prawns, marine and freshwater fish, yabbies, and mussels. Some of the most famous ones that you might know are Murray Cod, the Sydney rock oyster, the Eastern rock lobster, the balonies and sea urchins. And when we look at what we export to China, around about two thirds of it is abalone. So it's by far the larger section of all of that. But we also export a range of different things, such as the Eastern rock lobster, and some frozen and white fish, some live fish, uh, sometimes this is for growing out in China, but uh, a range of different things. And we'd like to include, include the sorts of uh, things that we export, such as oysters. Our own department, that is the Department of Primary Industries, is a division of the larger department called Regional New South Wales. And we sit within a unit which is called Engagement and Industry Assistance. Now, DPI is the largest rural research provider in Australia with a portfolio of $500 million of research and development projects. We have 25 research stations scattered across the state, over 13,000 hectare trial sites. So quite a large area. We have 650 technical and scientific staff who are employed, and New South Wales DPI is rated in the top 1% of 
research organisations in agriculture, plant and animal sciences in the world. Thank you for sharing your time with us this afternoon. Uh, my name's uh, Nicholas Giles. I'm a, a, the Senior Commercial Fisheries Manager for the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Um, and thank you for your time today. I'd like to um, give you an overview of the New South Wales Commercial Fisheries. Um, as a member of um, the Department of Primary Industries, um, our role is to administer the Fisheries Management Act, um, which is basically legislation which governs how we manage uh, the fisheries resources of New South Wales. Um, and what we do, uh, or the aim is to conserve, develop and share the fisheries of new resources um, of, of New South Wales and basically to ensure sustainability into the future. Um, under that, we also seek to promote a viable commercial fishing industry, that is a profitable um, industry. Um, we also have a role in sharing the resource between uh, the users, uh, primarily between the commercial and recreational sectors. Uh, and of course, harvest um, also provides social and economic benefits um, in New South Wales. Um, as a high level um, overview of our um, fisheries, um, there are around a thousand fishing businesses um, operating um, in our fisheries um, in eight marine um, fisheries. Um, there's a total of about 13,000 tonnes of production from our wild harvest fisheries. Um, with a value of approximately 90 to $100 million um, Australian dollars at the first point of sale. Um, all the fisheries that I'll talk about today um, are approved for export under Australian Commonwealth law. Most of the species um, are, are fully fished and sustainably, and sustainably fished. Um, so we're, we're highly confident um, that the harvest will continue um, well into the future. And there, there are some underutilised species, um, which are in fact um, future market opportunities. And I'll mention one of those particular um, during this talk. As a fisheries manager, um, the focus um, on management in New South Wales is through quota systems. Um, there are fisheries quotas in, implemented for our key species and fishing activities. Um, a quota is an output control, um, it governs uh, for example, the total amount of catch that can be taken or the total amount of effort that can be um, used to, to catch the fish. Um, this allows um, good management uh, to ensure sustainability and profitability. It also provides very strong fishermen's rights. They know exactly how much that they can catch and they can choose to either catch that or trade it to other fishermen. All these quotas are set, supported by strong scientific assessments. Um, the majority of these are set by an independent committee, are called the Total Allowable Fishing Committee. Um, this is a very powerful committee. It's their decision um, in setting the quotas and they're independent of government. The quota management structure also supports a harvest strategy framework, and that's a, a key management initiative um, that New South Wales is moving um, to. Um, in current times. And that is the primary objective is to maintain the stocks at a target level. You know, and that is generally to, um, to provide a, a high level of harvest or it can um, target high profitability. And that's a very powerful structure in that it ensures the stocks stay at sustainable levels and avoid um, going to low levels where sustainability can be a concern. So that supports ongoing supply of quality um, seafood into the future and industry profitability. In New South Wales, there are 26 species um, which are managed through the quota system. Uh, for example, at the top left, you can see Eastern Rock Lobster have a, a total allowable catch of 180,000 kilograms or 180 tonnes. Um, each of these species have their own total allowable catch. Um, Another example, abalone has a PAC of 100 tonnes. So that is the amount that can be harvested um, in, in each year. Again, um, certainty for industry and certainty of supply to markets. To dive a little further into the detail of some of our fisheries, I'll start off with our Estuary General Fishery. Um, this fishery has about 450 businesses operating in it. Um, it's a multi-species and, and, and method fishery. Um, there's a variety of traps used to catch crabs and fish, 
Um, there's nets used to take fish such as mullet um, and there's some hand gathering such as collecting pippies um, on ocean beaches. From a management purpose, the, the, the fishery is divided into seven regions in South Wales. Each region has its own characteristics, different numbers of fishermen, different stock levels, um, different harvest times, etc. Um, this fishery operates predominantly um, in the estuaries, um, but also um, takes some species on ocean beaches. Um, access to the fishery is, is controlled through um, the numbers of endorsements or commercial fishing licenses in effect that allow harvest. Um, there, there are also a number of quotas in this fishery um, con controlling the total amount, of, total amount of catch or effort. Um, in this um, fishery, um, there are some effort quotas. For example, um, if a fisherman is mesh netting, they're able to work a certain number of days a year. Um, if a fisherman's uh, trapping crabs, such as a mud crab, which you can see at the bottom right, um, they can use a certain uh, number of traps, uh, just depending on their level of access in the fishery. There are seven um, species um, that are quite managed in this fishery. Uh, mud crabs, again, bottom left, blue swimmer crabs, eels, um, pippies, as in the top right, taken on ocean beaches, cockles and ghost, numbers, uh, cockles and ghost nippers taken in estuaries, and beach worms taken on ocean beaches as well. Moving on to our estuary prawn trawl fishery. Um, this fishery contains around 100 fishing businesses. That's a single method fishery. Uh, that is um, generally small uh, trawl boats using auto trawl nets, um, taking many species. Uh, the primary target is school prawns. Uh, there's also a range of um, other fish and squid that are also taken. This fishery operates in, in three um, particular estuaries, um, major estuaries in New South Wales. <clears throat> Moving out to the ocean, um, we have our ocean trap and line fishery. There are around 280 fishing businesses in this fishery. Um, it's a multi-method and multi-species fishery. Um, fishermen use a variety of traps, such as fish traps to, to catch um, fin fish. Um, they use um, uh, nets to take spanner crabs, as you can see in the bottom right. And they also use lines. Um, either hand lines, trolling, or set lines to take other fish and shark species. Uh, there are the six um, quota many species in this fishery, spanner crabs, um, and some deep water fish species, um, which are hapuku, blue-eyed traveller, basque uh, gropa, gemfish, and pinkling. Our ocean hauling fishery um, is a fishery which uh, operates in the ocean and, and on ocean beaches, um, containing around 200 fishing businesses. Uh, multi-species, various species of fin fish are taken and, and, multi, and, and, and a range of different net methods. Um, again, for management um, purposes, the fishery is divided into seven regions. Um, endorsements control um, access or the number um, access to the fishery, um, i.e. the number of fishes, um, in, and in some cases um, there are species quotas controlling the amount of catch. Um, there are four species um, with quotas in this fishery, um, which are eastern sea garfish, Australian sardine, blue mackerel and yellow tail scab. Our ocean trawl fishery is one of our major uh, fisheries um, with around 150 fishing businesses operating in it. Um, a single method um, using trawl nets in ocean waters, uh, either um, otter prawn trawl nets or Danish seine trawl nets, and many species taken. Um, the main species are, are prawns and fish, uh, and particularly um, trawl whiting, um, which include um, eastern school whiting and stout whiting, um, and there's some other species including octopus. Uh, the amount of effort um, in this fishery is controlled through a, a prawn effort quota system which governs the amount of days that fishermen um, are allowed to work. Uh, there are four species um, with catch quotas in this fishery, um, and that is trawl whiting, blue spotted flathead, tiger flathead and silver trevally. One of our very interesting fisheries is our sea urchin and turban shell fishery. It's a relatively small fishery with around 40 fishing businesses operating in it. There's a catch quota for one species, uh, which is our red urchin. 
Um, in this fishery, um, the major species harvested um, by volume um, is the purple urchin, a scientific name, Centra stephanus rogersi. Um, now, we think there's a lot of uh, potential for development of this fishery. You can see some pictures at the bottom of this. Um, one of our divers um, with some, some merchants in hand and a, a well-presented um, plate um, of purple urchin. Um, now, this urchin has been recognised in, in recent years um, to be of high quality um, in some, some, um, some of our, our, our prime um, New South Wales restaurants, and it's also gained recognition in, in some overseas countries, including Japan. Um, so, um, you know, this fishery can produce likely um, more product than is currently being produced if more export markets uh, can be accessed. Another of our major fisheries is our, our lobster fishery, uh, which has around 100 fishing businesses operating in it. It's primarily a single method and species fishery. Um, that is taking our eastern rock lobsters uh, from traps um, from ocean waters. Um, this is a high value species um, with an initial point of sale price of around 75 Australian dollars. Um, these lobsters are, are very interesting. When they're harvested, they're green, uh, but when they're cooked, they turn red. Um, there is significant export of these um, to China and you may have seen these, these in your markets. Um, you might, might notice the tags on the lobsters in the right hand um, picture. Um, this is an important management tool which um, supports the um, integrity of the quota management system, but it also allows these, um, these particular species to be identified in the marketplace. And finally, I'd like to talk about our abalone fishery, um, a relatively small but valuable fishery. There are around 50 fishing businesses operating um, in this fishery, single method, um, that is hand gathering whilst, whilst diving, um, and single species. Um, so this is abalone, and this species is a black lip abalone, or Heliotis rubra. Um, relatively high, high value species and subject to a catch quota. Thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I hope this talk was useful. All right, let's start. New South Wales has a diversity of aquaculture species and a range of growing conditions from semi-tropical to temperate locations. This picture shows the world famous Sydney rock oyster ready for the table. New South Wales is a large state with plentiful marine, estuarine and land resources for aquaculture. Along our coastline, there are 33 estuaries, growing oysters and three embayments growing marine species. Trout can be grown in our mountain ranges and tropical barramundi in tanks in sheds. The New South Wales oyster industry began in the 1870s and is the largest aquaculture sector. There are 3,500 hectares of lease area set aside for aquaculture in estuarine and marine waters. Tiger prawn farming started in the 1980s in northern New South Wales in ponds, and the farming of the iconic native freshwater fish Murray cod has recently grown rapidly. This uses floating cages in water irrigation dams. This is a white fleshed freshwater fish with a delicate flavor and is much favored by Australians. Both oysters, and Murray Cod are seen as industries with much export potential. New South Wales is renowned for producing high quality seafood under stringent world-class food safety programs. The key species farmed in New South Wales include Sydney Rock, Pacific and native or Angazi oysters, Murray Cod, farmed tiger prawns, blue mussel, silver perch, rainbow trout, and freshwater crayfish or yabby. The Sydney rock oyster is farmed in 33 estuaries in New South Wales, reaching market size in 24 to 36 months. 
they are available all year to sell. The New South Wales Department of Primary Industries has a selective breeding program underway for faster growth, condition and disease resistance. Oysters in New South Wales are farmed on timber, post and rail infrastructure in plastic trays. Oysters are also farmed in post supported plastic baskets. And farmed on floating long lines. In the 1980s, the Australian farm tiger prawn industry started in earthen ponds on the New South Wales north coast. This is the Clarence River in the north of the state. Silver perch is a native freshwater fish to Australia and farming of this species commenced in the late 1980s in New South Wales in freshwater ponds. It is a fish favoured in the live fish trade in Australia. And more freshwater fish ponds. Murray cod is farmed in cages suspended in freshwater irrigation dams, making best use of available water. The freshwater crayfish, the Yabby, is one of many smooth shell crayfish in Australia and renowned for its hardiness to deal with drought or flood conditions. It is farmed at high density, but also cultured at low density in farm dams. It survives for three weeks in chilled foam boxes, making it ideal for live sales. Sea bass or barramundi is also farmed at high density in tanks in sheds in New South Wales. This is another fish favoured in the live fish market in New South Wales and Australia. Blue mussels are grown on floating long lines in Jervis and twofold bays along the coast of New South Wales. Yellowtail kingfish has been grown to five kilograms in 12 months in sea pens off Port Stephens, where the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries has an aquaculture research facility. New South Wales has a strong reputation for producing sustainable, high quality seafood. It has a proven base for business, trade and investment, a diversity of species and a range of growing conditions, a streamlined regulatory process, an international reputation for research and development, and an innovative and well-established industry. Government regulation promotes best industry practice and protects the environment. New South Wales has aquaculture strategies for land, oyster and marine aquaculture species. New South Wales is open for investment. Opportunities include marine, estuarine and land-based industries. High quality, sustainable seafood is available. The seafood processing, there are hatcheries, both freshwater and marine and research and development for mollusks, finfish and nutrition. Thank you for listening to my presentation. For more information, see www.dpi.nsw.gov.au. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for your um, time here today. I appreciate you um, listening to me and talking about um, the New South Wales oyster production and the New South Wales shellfish program. 
Um, so I'll be going through some slides. Um, and if you've got any questions at the end, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, so the first here we have a map just to show you uh, the region that we're talking about. It's in Australia, um, in the state of New South Wales. And our New South Wales oyster industry farms about 26 different estuaries uh, located right along the whole New South Wales coastline. So it's around about 1,000 kilometres of coastline from north to south. Um, and yeah, we have, we have 76 individual oyster harvest areas within all of those regions. I um, mean, if you ever come to Australia, um, you can do a lovely oyster tasting trip starting from the top and it will probably take you about two weeks to have a leisurely drive down and you can taste oysters from every single river. It would... So the, the core species that we grow, uh, we grow three different species of oysters um, in New South Wales. Uh, we grow the Pacific oyster, the Sydney rock oyster, and the native Ngazi oyster. Um, the Sydney rock oyster is about 90, 95% of production. Um, the Pacific oyster, you may know, quite, um, quite common throughout Asia and the world, it's growing everywhere. Um, the Ngazi is only growing in Australia. So the, the Sydney rock oyster and the Ngazi um, are a very rare oyster because they can only be, um, only, only be found in certain areas of Australia. Um, particularly New South Wales. Um, we, New South Wales is Australia's largest producer of edible oysters. Um, we're, we're probably about 50% of national production and the fourth largest in aquaculture industry in the country. We've been cultivating these in Australia or in New South Wales for about 120 years. And um, Australians, going right back to the First uh, Nations people, have been eating Sydney rock oysters and Angazis for about 40,000 years. So we have quite a long history with these oysters. Uh, we are very proud of them. Uh, so the Sydney rock oyster, as I said, is, is the primary oyster that's grown in New South Wales. Um, it's very iconic. It's a native species. Uh, we are one of the few uh, oyster production areas that grows a native species, species predominantly. Uh, in most other areas, disease has wiped out the natives and so they've switched over to um, the Pacific oyster, um, which has been um, resistant to most diseases found around the world. Uh, but we're very lucky that we've got very clean uh, waterways in New South Wales and we haven't had very many diseases, so we can still grow as Sydney rock oysters. Uh, they are regarded as one of the premium oysters, very different to the Pacific oyster that most people um, are are comfortable with around the world. Um, they're very slow growing. So in the same time, in this for the same size oyster, a Pacific oyster will be about one, one year old and a Sydney rock oyster will be three years old. So quite a long production cycle. Um, they grow slow and because of that they do tend to be a little bit smaller. Um, but, uh, but, but they have a, a sort of strong creamy but subtle flavour. Uh, very sweet, a lot sweeter than the Pacific, um, and they're very suitable for eating raw. That's most of our oysters in New South Wales are consumed raw. And really, until recently, we've e been eating most of the oysters that we grow. Uh, in the last four years, though, our production has been growing, um, and now we're, we're able to share them with the rest of the world. So we're looking to um, share our oysters that we've kept to ourselves for a while, uh, but they still... The production is growing, but still very small. So it's, it's a very rare oyster, and it's only grown, as I said, in New South Wales and some areas on the west coast of Australia and the southern um, portion of Queensland. Uh, so the oyster industry, it's a very valuable industry for us, um, especially along the coastal, um, the coastal region of New South Wales. Um, it provides quite a bit of employment, especially for um, um, people living in regional areas where there's not as many employment opportunities. Um, in the last year, it was worth 59 million. So, you know, a, a small industry by some standards, but uh, quite large in terms of our fisheries production. And it, it's worth 73% of the value of New South Wales aquaculture. So, as I said, for us, it is a very important industry. And so we do do a lot of work, as you'll see in the rest of my presentation, to protect the industry, and in particular, to protect water quality 
to ensure that when people eat the oysters, they can be confident that they are safe. Um, so food safety and quality is always the number one priority when um, we're, we're selling and harvesting our oysters. Um, and that's, from, that's a commitment from government, industry and the community. Um, so I run, as the manager of the New Wales Shellfish Program, I run the monitoring program that uh, monitors water and oyster quality throughout the entire state of New South Wales. Uh, we operate under the premier food safety agency within New South Wales called the New South Wales Food Authority. Um, so we mon monitor the harvest areas for food safety risks. We actively manage all 76 harvest zones. Um, and when I say manage, we, we open and close them very regularly. Um, if there's a little bit of rain and we think there might be a bit of runoff, um, even though it's probably safe to harvest, if there's any chance that there may be some small risk, we close. So we have zero um, tolerance for any food safety risk. We want to make sure that every single oyster is 100% safe uh, before we sell it. Um, and, and this is very well supported by our industry as well as by uh, the Food Authority as the Food Safety Agency and Enforcement Agency. So we conduct over 10,000 tests every single year in the water and oysters growing along the, along the state. Um, and so this monitoring helps us to ensure that we have a very clear picture of the water quality and the safety of the oysters. Um, and we, we monitor that 365 days a year. So there are government officers such as myself um, watching the weather, watching the, um, the harvest areas and implementing closes, closures every single day of the year. And so the result is safe, high quality oysters, which is uh, what everybody wants. Um, and so just a little bit about the New South Wales Food Authority. We operate under the New South Wales Food Act. Um, we have quite broad reaching powers when it comes to any food production business. We have very strong powers of inspection and enforcement where we can enter any food business. Um, we actually have more powers of entry, questioning, recording, sampling than the police have within the state. Um, so, you know, sometimes the police like us to go with them because we can take them into places that they can't. But I think that really demonstrates the, the priority that we, we, that we place on food safety. That's a very high priority. Um, so when, when we find people aren't doing the wrong thing, uh, which is thankfully not very often in the oyster industry, but on the occasion that we do, um, we can issue fines for minor infringements um, up to imprisonment and anybody who receives an infringement gets put on our name and shame list which is published on our website um, and so that that means that their name is up there as someone who has done the wrong thing and not complied. Um, this is a very strong encouragement to encourage our businesses to do the right thing because once they're on there uh, they find that their customers do not want to buy from them. And within the oyster industry, the other oyster farmers get very, very angry when another farmer has, um, has not followed the rules because they see that that other farmer is risking their business and the whole industry. And so they are, they're often ostracized and shunned and, and pushed out of the industry by the other businesses. Um, yeah, so, so we're very happy with that. There's a very strong food safety culture within the industry that we've developed uh, because they, they want to have pride in their product and they only want to sell uh, an oyster that is safe. So I talked a little bit about the environment and I think one of the most important aspects of growing a safe and, and nutritious oyster um, is the environment that it's grown in. Oysters filter feed and they concentrate anything that's in the water to up to a hundred times the concentration. So if the water is pure and clean and pristine, you'll, it'll be concentrating wonderful, clean, pure nutrients, things like zinc, iodine, selenium, protein, omega-3s, um, all these things that are very, very beneficial to health. Um, and you know, oysters are known as an aphrodisiac and I, that, that's likely the very high levels of zinc. Um, and I did mention that, um, Sydney rock oysters take a little bit longer to grow, um, three times longer to, to grow than Pacifics. Uh, when we do our, our surveys for quality, we often find that in an area, the Sydney rock oysters will have much higher zinc levels. And I think that's because they grow slowly. They take time to mature, 
to absorb those nutrients. And so they may look smaller, but um, don't underestimate them. They are, they are quite potent in terms of the nutrients and vitamins and minerals that you will receive from them. And so the government is extremely committed to this industry. The commitment that the government makes to protecting in this industry, I would say is, it goes beyond what you would expect from the size of the industry. Uh, we have a number of government policies that protect water quality, in particular water quality in oyster production areas. So the first is the Oyster Industry Sustainable Aquaculture Strategy. Um, this is a very, uh, for, I think it was a world first strategy that we put out in terms of, it's a comprehensive strategy that ensures that not only that the water quality is protected for the industry, but also it mandates that the industry must protect the environment that they're operating in. Um, and so this strategy is then also linked to some of our planning policies. And so I, I'm, I'll go down to the second point, which is the primary production and rural development state environmental planning policy. A um, little bit of a long title, but basically what that does is it links the oyster leases and the oyster farms in with the state planning um, legislation. And so if somebody wants to build a new development, whether it's a single house or a large five-star hotel, um, if it's near an oyster lease, they are not allowed to build that unless they can prove that it is not going to impact water quality on that oyster lease. Um, and so that's very, very strong protection. Um, and and the, I, me and my counterpart, Ian Lyle, that you would have heard from, who is the aquaculture manager, we will actually review those developments um, and provide comment back to the planning authority on whether we think they should be approved or not. Um, so, so that's a, a very, very strong protection and even very large developers cannot get around that. There is no room within that policy for somebody to you know, subvert the system or try and get around it. They have to protect the oyster leases. Um, we also have developed the New South Wales Diffuse Water Pollution Strategy. Uh, diffuse water pollution is going beyond pollution just from identified sources, such as hotels or houses, to everything that comes through from just when it rains naturally. You know, even a very pristine water, you can sometimes have you know, some issues come down. And so we have a, a strategy that covers the whole state that really focuses again on the oyster industry. And you can see here um, in my presentation, there's a photo of a device that actually filters the stormwater. So where we have a township um, and you have stormwater, instead of just diverting that stormwater that comes off the roads and so forth via a drain directly into the river. Um, we've built, in, mo in the majority of areas, we've built these devices that filter and, and purify the stormwater before it goes into the waterway. So uh, again, as you can see, the whole catchment, we work um, quite tirelessly to try and protect water quality. And we don't just look at one thing or another, we look at every single risk and make sure that it's protected. Um, overarching that protection, we have what we call uh, another piece of legislation called the Protection of the Environment Operations Act. And so uh, this is overseen by the New South Wales Environmental Protection Authority. Again, they have very strong powers to uh, regulate and, and act, enact enforcement measures on any industry, on any, even on a government organisation that runs, say, a, a sewage system in, in the township. Um, they can go in and find them and take action. And so uh, because of the work, we work very closely with them to, again, to protect water quality. And we've systematically reviewed every single risk factor across the catchment in every single harvest area. Um, and we constantly meet with them to review and make sure that that protection is working. Um, as, as I mentioned under the sustainable oyster industry, sustainable aquaculture strategy, uh, the industry themselves uh, are very committed to protecting their environment. Um, our oyster farmers are very proud of the waterways that they work in. They're very proud of the oysters that they grow out of those waterways. Um, you know, that they're, they're people that they don't necessarily make a lot of money, but a lot of the, what they get out of the job is the enjoyment of sending very good quality product out. Um, and so as part of that, they want to make sure that the environment that they work in um, is clean and pristine. And as part of this, they don't just look at 
the the rubbish and any anything that they produce but they look at everything that comes in from anyone throughout the community and most years um, the the farms in each estuary will go around in the boat you can see a photo of it here this is february 2020 um, so again because of covid they had to they couldn't have as big a group uh, but they still did it they broke up into smaller groups and they went around and they found every single as you can see concrete blocks anything that was littering the waterway um, and they cleaned it up and so they do this quite regularly to ensure that there's a pristine environment um, I, th I think this this makes them feel good and, and also the community then views them in in a good light then the oyster farmers are often seen as the protectors of the waterway you know, upholding those environmental values and Australians um, Australians really find have a lot of satisfaction in knowing that the waterways are clean enough that they can eat oysters from because we know that to eat an oyster from the waterway the waterway needs to be cleaner than for fishing or swimming or even if you're going to drink the water it is the highest use and so for the community if they look out and they see the oyster farms are there and there's safe oysters they know that the waterway is safe for any other type of use that they may wish to enjoy. Um, and as part of this, I mentioned before that they have a very, very strong food safety culture. Um, they have a commitment to safe food production. And really, if there's a new farmer that comes in, uh, one, of the, one of the things that the other farmers, they'll all go around and talk to them and explain, these are the rules, these are the food safety rules, you must follow them. Um, you know, that, that, that's something that happens every time a new person joins the industry. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's, it, in some ways that is as good as having a, a strong enforcement agency behind them as well. They know they have us, but um, yeah, that, they want to make sure that they, between themselves, enforce the rules and commit to safe food production. And um, also with one thing that we've rolled out is our free COVID-19 training available. So most of our farmers have done them they will have all done them done that training very shortly um, all businesses are what we call COVID-19 compliance so they understand the COVID-19 risks uh, they are managing them um, and we are very lucky in Australia that we have not had very many cases so far um, but despite that we still make sure that our industry is aware of the risks and um, and manages them uh, this, the, the last thing in there is that each of those estuaries has also developed their own industry environmental management system. So I mentioned how the government goes out and looks at pollution sources and, and protects the environment. The industry also does that themselves. So we have lots of eyes out there looking for anything that may uh, threat, threaten the water quality um, and taking action to make sure that it stops. And so the third tranche to this environmental protection is the community, the people that live um, all around the waterways. And so both the government and the industry engage quite strongly with the local communities, again, to encourage protection of oyster leases. Um, and, ex and, and once the community understands what it means to have high quality oysters and a, and a viable, strong oyster industry in terms of the good water quality, then they're happy to see the oyster leases there. They're happy to know that the oyster farmers are there protecting the waterway and making sure that it's their clean waterway into the future for them, their kids, their grandkids. Uh, we, we put this signage on the waterway uh, for people, for tourists that come past in boats and things to educate them to say, you know, this is what we expect of you if you're on this waterway. So it is illegal for them to anybody to discharge or pollute from a boat. Um, but we also put this there to remind them that, you know, you, you have to do this, you should do this. Um, there's oyster leases there. Uh, there's oyster farmers that are going to be watching you and good swimming the public is also watching you, watching you so um that's the, we, we've we've been fairly successful in that um it's a hard thing to do but we have managed to um in, to educate our boating community that they must not do any discharge anything when they are in those estuaries that have oysters Finally, we have our Coast Care Initiative, um, which is a, a, a federal government program that teaches communities and also goes into schools. So we're teaching their next generation to care for the environment. And we also explain to them about the importance of protecting water quality around oyster farms. 
So, um, as, this, as you can see, we, we have quite a lot of things that we are currently doing, uh, but we also like to um, look to the future and try and develop new technologies to continuously improve the program that we develop, um, you know, work more efficiently and effectively um, to reduce safe oysters. So we have currently what's called a food agility CRC project where we are implementing uh, real-time monitoring into our areas. So we have 24-hour um, electronic surveillance of the harvest areas. And um, you can see here, um, they, they, it doesn't look like much from the outside, just a solar panel in the box. But if you look inside, um, there's some quite clever electronics inside there and um, some quite um, expensive probes um, that are very, collect very, very accurate uh, water quality measurements constantly. And so that provides an independent and verifiable data source to show uh, what's happening and to show that there's compliance with the risk management plans that we put in place. Um, the, this new technology has so far proven reliable and accurate. Um, we've implemented it into a small number of estuaries and we are looking to continue to roll this out. Um, a new thing that we're working on is also new testing technology. Um, currently, we collect most of our samples and then have to send them off to a laboratory um, to be tested where we're looking to develop uh, fast, faster testing technologies that can be used on the farm. So we're getting that food safety information a lot more quickly and again, improving our system even further. And, you know, I don't just take my word for it that our oysters are safe. Um, one of the things that we have done is we've had independent studies undertaken that were separate from the industry and the food authority um, to test whether or not our oysters were as safe as we thought they were. And we were very, very pleased with the results. Uh, there were two main risks that you really need to be concerned of if you are eating oysters raw. Or without, um, and when I say raw, that's that they have, if they're not being cooked uh, for at least three minutes at 60 degrees. So unless you're boiling them for a long time um, or steaming them for a long time, um, then, then you really want to make sure that the oysters that you are eating um, do not contain human viruses, norovirus and hepatitis A are the two most common ones. And also that there are not high levels of vibrios. Um, in particular, Vibrio parahemolyticus is a fairly common bacterial pathogen um, that has been associated with illness in people eating raw oysters. And so I have good news on both fronts. If you're looking to eat some Sydney rock oysters in particular, uh, we did do a survey of Australian oysters. We took 300 samples and we had zero positive for norovirus and hepatitis A. Um, that I, can, I can provide a link to the published paper on this uh, work if you're interested. And that compares very, very favorably to other countries that have done surveys. Uh, the UK did a survey of oysters in the UK marketplace that were being sold in shops, and they had 75% positive. Um, I've seen other studies in other parts of Europe, such as France, and they have had figures in the area of 15 to 35% positive. Um, and even in the US, um, they did have quite a number of positives uh, around and above 10% positive uh, for viruses. So the fact that we have zero positive um, is a very, very good uh, confirmation that our oysters are safe and, and we also do not see uh, the illness outbreaks that are off you know, that do are associated with with oysters in some other countries so oysters often have a bit of a bad name um, but certainly in Australia uh, that they, they do not have that bad name because we do not get sick from eating our oysters because we put so much effort into ensuring that they're growing in a very very clean environment and we, have, we are very lucky to have such a, a clean environment too. Uh, the second risk is Vibrio parahemolyticus. And you know, th this is something that, especially if the oysters are harvested from warmer waters, um, although there were some oysters from Alaska that caused illness, um, harvested from cold waters and did cause Vibrio parahemolyticus illness um, on a cruise. Uh, but we had never seen this from Sydney rock oysters. Um, and so we wondered why this was, and we, we were lucky enough to have a very, very uh, renowned scientist working um, in Australia for a few years. And we asked him to look into this, and he, he thought that we must, there must be something, that we were missing something. And so he did the work, and as you can see with the graph down the bottom, um, the, the squares are Pacific oyster and how the 
this bacteria will grow at different temperatures. And you can see as the temperature down the bottom, the storage temperature gets higher, Pacific oysters do grow much, much faster. Uh, Vibrio grows much, much faster in them. But the, the black triangles, which is the Sydney rock oyster, zero growth right through. And he was very, very surprised. He says he said that he has never seen this in any oyster anywhere else in the world and that the Sydney rock oyster has unique antibacterial properties. Um, so you know, as, as, as we've said before, it's a very slow growing oyster. It's also a very strong, hardy oyster. Um, it can last out of water for up to three weeks. Uh, if, if you store it properly in cool, moist environment, three weeks shelf life. Um, that's very, very long. Most other oysters, Pacifics, you would be very lucky to get a week, probably less. Um, and so this is because it's a slow, strong, resilient oyster. Um, it has a, a much harder shell, it seals very well, and it suppresses the growth of any bacteria while it's alive. And while it's so, so there's no, there's actually no need to put it back into um, a storage tank when you receive it. We can ship it from Australia. Um, it can get to you very, very quickly within a day or two. But when you receive it, you will still have quite a few weeks to um, to sell the product alive and fresh, just as it came out of the water um, in our in our harvest areas. So, in summary. Um, what does all of this mean? It means that you can eat our oysters raw uh, with confidence. And there's a photo of me eating an oyster right out of the water from one of my harvest areas. Um, and yeah, I'm very confident to do that because I know how much work has been put in, you know, uh, to ensure that the pollution is managed, that the risks are managed, um, that the industry is compliant and there's strong regulation to enforce the compliance that the industry themselves um, want to comply and want to produce a, a safe product um, and that the government and community are supporting us. So yeah, the conclusion is that New South oysters can be safely consumed without cooking. Do you have any questions? Ni hao, my name is Eric Poole. I'm the business development manager at Sydney Fish Market in Sydney, Australia. Now, today I'd like to introduce the Sydney Fish Market, which is the biggest fish market in Australia um, and one of the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we'll start off with a few facts. Um, so Sydney Fish Market is an industry-owned company. We are owned by the Catchers Trust, which represents all our fishermen in New South Wales. Um, and the other shareholder is our tenants and merchants who are the wholesalers and buyers uh, at our market, um, some of them anyway. Um, and so Sydney Fish Market is made up of these two groups. We represent the industry in New South Wales and, um, and also Australia as well. Um, so Sydney Fish Market, as you can see in this screenshot here, um, we run a Dutch auction system. Um, and so we have uh, everything is bid electronically. So the product comes in, it's laid out on the auction floor um, and all of our transactions happen online. Now, obviously this photo here is uh, pre COVID. Um, and so you can see everybody's closer together. Um, and one of the big changes we had to make um, when COVID hit Australia um, was obviously the spatial distancing um, and so half of our buyers had to leave the auction stand, as you can see it now, um, and bid, bid remotely. So they are using uh, laptops or computers, um, either at home or in offices near the fish market. Um, now, that'll be good for going forward because um, we would like to eventually, when we get our digital trading system fully running, we would like to also invite overseas buyers uh, to participate on our auction as well. Uh, overall seafood sales um, for a financial year. Um, so this is not previous financial year, but uh, 2019 uh, was about $146 million. Um, most of it traded through the auction sales. 
Um, we do have a non-auction sales stream, which is for our fixed price commodities, uh, bulk commodities like salmon, uh, kingfish and others. Uh, total product traded in that year was about 13,300 tonnes. Um, and that's made up of about 400 to 500 species of seafood. Um, now, auction product obviously is about 11,000 tonnes, uh, non-auction 1,900 tonnes. Uh, most of our product comes from New South Wales, um, but we do receive product from all over Australia and also a lot from New Zealand as well. Um, and so the overseas product and interstate is about roughly half of what we sell. As you can see in this uh, uh, slide here, it's a breakdown of where our product supply is coming from. Um, so as you can see, New South Wales is the bulk um, and then we've got Queensland, uh, New Zealand, um, South Australia in that order and little bits from the other states. Uh, this is one of our tours that we conduct at the markets um, and the tour guide showing a mud grab, live mud grab. Um, and so that is our biggest uh, commodity at the fish market by value. Um, we sell a lot of mud crab um, and it's uh, one of the favoured uh, live species at the fish market. We also have a cooking school at the fish market um, for those who choose to visit Sydney when things reopen. Um, and that's a great way to show Sydney people how to cook and eat seafood. Um, especially some of the tricky species like uh, how to clean squid or prawns and other things. Uh, these are just some location shots at the fish market. So you can see obviously uh, fish displays. Um, we have a variety of operators. Uh, the biggest thing about the fish market I think is it's on the water. So uh, some of our products are delivered direct to the fish market. Um, and that's great for the visitors because they can see the fishing boats, they can see how they, you know, fix their nets and other such things. Uh, one of the big events at the fish market is Chinese New Year. Um, and so pre-COVID, we used to get a lot of uh, Chinese visitors coming across uh, for Chinese New Year. Um, and after Christmas and Easter, I would say that's the next biggest event that we have. Um, obviously it's not uh, happening anymore, but uh, hopefully COVID will finish soon. Uh, also blessing of the fleet here, you can see there's a lot of tradition around um, the Italian fishing connection in Sydney. Now just talking about the future, uh, Sydney fish market doesn't currently export, but um, we are definitely looking to export going into the future. Um, this screenshot here is our new fish market, which um, the New South Wales government has kindly agreed to fund for us. Um, obviously we will pay rent, um, but yes, that's uh, gonna be a state of the art building, um, purpose built. It'll be the most advanced fish market in the world in terms of how we handle the produce, um, our auction systems, all digital, um, and also state of the art uh, processing. Um, and so we don't want to wait till that new fish market to start exporting. We would like to work on that, you know, as soon as we can. Um, and so we essentially, we would like to know from the buyers in China, what products they would like to source from us. Um, and we're more than happy to be in contact. We have a lot of fishermen who supply through us. Um, and essentially we will use our brand, um, to get those products to China. Um, so we would very much like to hear from prospective buyers about the types of products they're looking for um, and also, you know, start to discuss some of the economies because um, obviously to get it to you, um, everybody has to, uh, has to earn what they need. Um, but this is, you know, that's a new market that's about three years away three to four years. Um, and so, yes, we are very much looking forward to that. Uh, just some of the location shots around the market. Um, this is what uh, the schematic will look like from the south to the north. Um, and as you can see in these photos, like the current fish market is a very closed up building. Um, we will 
definitely be having this sort of open to show the public and visitors more of what is happening at the market. Um, and for remote bidders, for example, anyone who might be bidding from overseas or interstate, um, they will see a lot more of the product than what we show them now. Um, so there'll be photos of the product potentially, um, which they can view before making uh, bidding decisions. Another location shot. Um, and essentially the fish market, we act like a, um, act like a connector between our fishers, um, the buyers and the public. Um, and so moving into the future and the new, um, new digital trading space, uh, we want to basically have all the fishers um, and have their product go through our trading platform. Um, and so that will provide everything uh, for the fishermen, pricing, statistics, um, logistics options to get to the customers. Um, and then for us to the customers, we will provide all of that information online. So they have everything that they need to make a purchasing decision. And this is our sort of purpose, which is um, essentially to unite people and the sea. Uh, that's how we see ourselves in the Australian marketplace. Um, this, is, this is more corporate stuff. So this is uh, some of the pillars. So, you know, we're an intimate and adventurous seafood culture, a diverse marketplace. Um, we have pride of provenance and we're providing nourishment for tomorrow's communities. And so for the new market, um, this is um, something that uh, was written a while ago about the Opera House. Um, so a Danish architect delivered, uh, designed the Opera House um, and we have Danish architects who are designing our new fish market or have designed. Um, and so we would like to be an iconic destination in Sydney, um, not just for locals, but also for our international uh, visitors as well. And that is it. Thank you very much.